Okay? I'm going to tell you. I promise. I'm going to tell you. What are these two rules? Um, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2. So this morning we are continuing uh, in our series on the book of Philippians. Uh, before we get into that, I wanted to just uh, talk to you a little bit. I want to take time for prayer. We've been, uh, we've been praying every week for one of our ones. All right. If you're new, you don't know what that is. Um, I, I'm challenging the church in 2020. Um, Vision 2020 is simply this, that each one reach one. As God has in his mercy saved us, uh, he calls us to go out and share that good news with others. And so um, that's, that's the calling he puts on all of our lives. And so we've been praying for uh, each one, um, somebody that maybe God has placed in your life that he has laid on your heart to reach with the gospel here in 2020. And so uh, I want to start challenging. We've been praying for a different one every week. I want you to continue to do that. Pray for your one. Um, by this point, you should have made it through the 30-day prayer guide. There's more on the table, the blue table um, um, in the back, our next steps table. And you can get one of those if you don't have one, but if you should have already made it through that. So here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. If you had not already done this, do it again, okay? Um, keep praying for that. It's a wonderful prayer guide, so just kind of go through that 30, every 30 days um, through the, out the year and, uh, we're, as we pray for our one. Uh, here's what I want to encourage you to do in that Vision 2020. I, I want to kind of give you some encouragement, challenges, ways to reach out to your one. Um, and, and this is going to vary depending on a person, but um, here's what I want to encourage you to do. We've been praying for them. If you haven't already, I want you to make contact with them. All right, You say, well, pastor, I work with them. Well, that's great. Or they're in your family. That's, then you've already made that contact. But maybe your one is somebody that's a neighbor. And um, you don't, you know, you're in winter time, you're all cooped up and you don't see them very much and so forth. So I, what I, want you, I just want you to in some way connect with them, whether it's, um, you know, being intentional about stopping by and saying hi. Maybe, uh, maybe it's something you send them a note or card or an email or a text, something to just connect with them. Um, it, it may even be that you take the step of inviting them to go to coffee or something. But just want you, sometime this month, I, I want you to be connecting with them, okay? So that's, that's, your, that's your first step. Just connect with them. If you haven't already done that, renew that connection, whatever it is here throughout the month of, we're in March, right? March? Yeah, March. All right. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yes. And so winter is, is it out of here? Is anybody willing to say that? It's out of here. All right. Let's hope so. All right. Well, hey, as we get into our message this morning, um, I, there, there's a leadership book. I said we're continuing in our series on Philippians, talking about uh, learning how to live a life that is a powerful testimony for Christ. Um, there's a leadership book that, that, um, that is written by a man by the name of David Cottrell. Or Cottrell? 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 I don't know how you pronounce that. David Cottrell. Anyway, the, the title of the book is this. It is uh, The First Two Rules of Leadership. The First Two Rules of Leadership. And so the premise of the book is this, that, um, that these two rules are, um, are, are, are baseline for, um, for leadership. In other words, if you break these two rules, if you break one of these two rules, as a leader, nothing else matters. Uh, if you break one of these two rules, it doesn't matter how bright you are, how organized you are, how great ideas you have, what you bring to the table. None of that matters if you break one of these two rules. Um, if, if you break one of these two rules, you've lost that leadership ability. Now, somebody, how many of you are wondering, what are these two rules? Okay, I'm going to tell you. I promise, I'm going to tell you. What are these two rules? Um, number one, here it is. And, and these, are, these are complicated. It's deep. It's difficult. Okay? Here's rule number one. First rule of leadership, according to David Cottrell, and I'm going to tell you, I, I tend to agree with him on these two things. Rule number one, okay, this is not point number one, sorry, not point number one yet. This is just rule number one, okay? We'll get to our things. Rule number one, first rule of leadership is this don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Now think about this, okay? Think about it. You say, well, don't be, that's a rule of leadership. Yeah, don't be stupid. How many leaders have fallen over being stupid? A lot. Being stupid. Doing something personally or 
or, or even organizationally that is morally or illegal, <laughs> something along those lines, right? Um, don't do something that will put you or your team or your organization in a bad position. Don't do something stupid. Don't be stupid. Um, the second one is very similar. Um, the first one, don't be stupid. The second one, y'all are going to love this. Anybody want to guess? No? Okay. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> first two rules of leadership. No, they're not synonymous. They're, so, they're different. Think about it. They're different. Don't be stupid and don't be a jerk. Listen, nobody likes arrogance. Amen? Um, uh, listen, yes, you want your leader to be competent, but you don't want your leader to think they know everything and everybody else is, is the stupid one, right? Um, uh, nobody wants to follow. The quickest way to lose your team or your coworkers or whomever you're leading or even your family is to act like a jerk. Um, we all prefer leaders who are humble, who don't act like jerks. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think those two rules are pretty good advice. So if, if we want to say those two rules are pretty good advice, I, the question for us then becomes, um, how do we, if being humble, living with humility is, is the better route, it's the way to be a better husband, a better father, a better wife, a better spouse, a better um, leader at work, a better leader in the church, if, the, if being humble is the better way, the better route, and, and the way to be a powerful testimony for Christ, then how can we do that? What does it mean to be humble? How do, how, do, how do we do that? What does it look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here in chapter 2 of Philippians, we're going we're gonna to see that the Apostle Paul addresses that. Um, Paul talks about that. I believe he gives us uh, some ways in which we can live with an attitude of humility. If you remember, um, as we read through the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi from prison. He was in prison in Rome, and he wrote this to the church in Philippi to encourage them in their faith and, and, to, and to teach them, to teach them how to continue to be a powerful testimony for Christ. We, we looked at Acts chapter 16, some of the wonderful uh, testimony of uh, the testimony of Lydia and the Philipp Philippian jailer and how God saved them and redeemed them. And the Philippian church was a, was a good church. Uh, but Paul wants to encourage them how to continue to be that powerful testimony for Christ. But one thing, you know, you know it's amazing to me how when we're trying to live for Christ, how the devil can get his greasy, grimy little hands into things. Right? Um, it's, it's amazing to me how the devil can get his hand in our lives and cause trouble. It's amazing how the devil can get his little greasy, grimy hands in relationships and cause trouble. Amen? And it's even amazing to me how the devil gets his greasy, grimy hands in the church and causes trouble. Um. How would you, we'll probably talk about this a couple of times in this series, um, how would you um, feel if you were at odds with somebody else uh, so much and then somebody wrote your name down and that was written down for all the rest of church history to see? <gasps> That's what happened in Philippians. We're going to see this, we'll see it when we get to chapter 4, but Paul starts addressing it here in chapter 2. There were two ladies, one by the name of Euodia, the other one by the name of Syntyche, okay? I don't know if that's proper pronunciation, but there's some good choices if you're expecting a child. Um, but these two ladies were at odds, and we don't know what they were odds about, but they were, they were fighting about something. And as happens a lot of times, I would imagine that people took sides, and they began to have conflict in the church. And so uh, as we'll look at this in more detail over in chapter 4, uh, Paul begins to address this. Uh, by, in, in here in chapter 2, by encouraging the church to be of one mind. Look at chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 1. Paul writes, he says, Therefore, as he has laid out um, praying for them, as we talked about last week, talked about the sovereignty of God in their lives and how they should uh, live for Christ at the end of chapter 1, he says, Therefore, if there is any consolation or encouragement in Christ, <laughs> 
if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy. Listen, if you're encouraged by Christ, if you have the love of God in you, if you, if you are, are fellow uh, Christians in, in the Spirit of Christ, then he gives a command here, verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Paul here is encouraging them. He's, he's encouraging these two factions in the church that are at odds with each other for whatever reason. He's saying, listen, if you are saved, if you are one in the Spirit, which they are, they just need to be reminded of that, amen? He said, listen, it's time to get along and be unified. And here Paul in verse 3 then begins to tell them how to do that and what the problem is in that. Look what he says. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Selfish ambition is the Greek word erethea. It means fractiousness. Uh, you think of fra- factions and, and so forth, but you think of uh, partisanship. Think politicians. Think Democrat, Republican. <laughs> A lot of fighting going on there, Right? In fact, right now, there's fighting going on inside each party and stuff. We all like to fight and so forth. But, but this is talking about someone who is only concerned about their own interest, their agenda. They, they want their way and not the other person's way. And then it says, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. It's, it's the Greek word kenodoxia, uh, made up of two different words, kenos and doxia, uh, vain or, or empty glory. Uh, it's speaking of pride here. No, nothing be done through selfishness, selfish ambition, or pride. Both of these words describe a person who is causing discord because they are prideful and just seeking their own interests. They're wanting their way and not another way. So what Paul is saying here, as he gives this first little command, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, What Paul's saying here, the first way we can begin living with an attitude of humility is this. To stop looking out for number one. Stop looking out for number one. Now, that's opposite of what what is told to us in the world, right? The world tells us to look out for number one, right? you gotta, you got to be careful because nobody else is going to be concerned about you, so you got to look out for you. you got to take care of you because nobody else will. Friends, that's the opposite of what Jesus teaches. I want you to look at what it says here in Mark chapter 9 on your screen. Mark chapter 9 says this, Then he, Jesus, came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them. Who's, who's the them? It's the disciples. So Jesus, talking to the disciples, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? What were you arguing about? What were you fighting about? But they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. I I think he likes me better. No, 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 no. Remember that time? No, no, he likes me better. No, I think... He disputed, they, they, were, they were arguing back and forth, you know. No, I think I'm, not. and Jesus sat down, called them, called the 12 and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Jesus throws the world's ideas about how to be a leader on his head, Amen. Jesus says, listen, you want to be a leader? You want to be great in the kingdom of God? You must be last of all. You must be servant of all. Friends, that's, that's really what Paul is saying here in verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit out of pride or selfishness. Don't let that be your motivation. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Why does Paul say this, friends? Because it is selfishness and pride. That's what causes division. James chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure or those those that selfishness, the desire to want what you want, that wars in your members? Friends, listen, that's where that's where argument, confrontation, all those things come from. And can I just tell you that whether it's in the church or outside the church or whatever, that that is not a good testimony for Christ. Amen. If we want to let our lives be a powerful testimony for Christ, friends, we need to stop putting ourselves first. 
The way to counter wars and fights among us is to stop looking out for number one. You say, but pastor, if I don't look out for me, who will? I'm glad you asked. God will. God will. Leave it to him. We'll see that, come back to that in just a couple of moments. I happened to cross um, what I believe is a, a great example of this. It's outside of the Christian world, if you will. Um, NBA star Dwayne Wade played the majority of his career with the Miami Heat. Uh, he was drafted fifth overall in 2003, and along with Shaquille O'Neal, led the Heat just a couple years later in 2006 to the NBA championship. He was, he was the star of the team. However, partly because he got injured the next year, Shaq asked to be traded and was traded to another team, and so that kind of left their team uh, in a, in a, uh, with, with not many great players, and they couldn't get back uh, to the finals and where they wanted to be. They kind of floundered around for a few years until Wade enticed two of his friends to come down and play with him. Anybody remember who that was? Chris Bosch and LeBron James. And so here were Dwayne Wade, who was the star of the team for the longest time, Chris Bosh, who was a star on the team he came from, and LeBron James. They were three superstars. Um, everybody expected them just to run through the league. In fact, I think I remember when LeBron James had the press conference, uh, he talked about winning not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven championships. Their expectations were high. Who in the world could stop them? Who could keep them from winning it all? Let me tell you who. It was the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> 2011, uh, yes, they had a great regular season, and they even uh, just walked right through the playoffs until they got to, to, the, to the final series, and the Dallas Mavericks beat them, uh, I believe it was four games to two, in the final series. Uh, they were expected to win it all in. After losing those finals in that 2011 season, Dwayne Wade knew that some things needed to change. The partnership between Wade and LeBron needed fine-tuning. Even though the Heat had been Wade's team since he was drafted, Dwayne Wade realized over the course of that season that LeBron James was actually the better player. Wade knew that he had to put the franchise he had built into another superstar's hand. The conversation happened in the Bahamas when they were both on vacation with their families. It was the first time we'd seen each other since we lost, Dwayne Wade recalls. He says, I remember sitting with my wife and just thinking, what can I do next year to be better? He said, I knew it wasn't what I did on the court. He'd given his all, played, played well. So he said, I knew it had to be something else. I watched LeBron up close. I knew he could go to a level that I couldn't go to anymore. And I also wanted to take a little bit of that looking over his shoulder mentality away. So he says, I went to him and said, go ahead. I want you to be yourself. I want you to lead. I want you to be great. And we'll all figure out how to be great around you. The importance of that conversation was not lost on the Heat's coach. Coach Eric Sprolster later said, How many guys are willing to do that? How many superstars are willing to do that? Are willing to humble themselves and let another guy be the lead guy while he takes a back seat? He said, that's when our team really took off. And the next year, they won the championship. In fact, the next two years, they won. All because Dwayne Wade was willing to play a role around another guy being the superstar. Friends, sometimes to be our best, we have to humble ourselves. We have to be willing to take a step back. We have to be willing to swallow our pride and and stop looking out for number one. Here's how the Bible puts it. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12 says this. And whoever exalts himself will be humble, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the Scripture teaches if we want to be all that and we want to push our way to the top and we want to do all that, go for it, but you're on your own. You're on your own for good. But if we're willing to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and we're willing to let God 
lead us and guide us and direct us and let and, and live for him, then and we're willing to humble ourselves for him, then he will lift us up. I would go with that one. Amen. Friends, um, as we seek how to live a life of humility, we seek what does this humility look like? We see that it first involves stopping to stop looking out for number one. But second, it involves start putting others first. We need to stop looking out for number one, but we need to start putting others first like Jesus did. Let's look at verse three again. In fact, let's finish verse three. We read the first part, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, in humility, in humbleness of mind, in in, 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 in having a humble opinion of so take ourselves off of that high horse and let us um, put on some humility. So some people, when they think of humility, thinks, okay, so I've got to think less of myself. Is that what you're saying, Pastor? So what you want me to do is to think less of myself. Actually, um, that's not it at all. Friends, um, I believe C.S. Lewis put it best when he said this, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less, less often. That's the problem, friends. We think of ourselves too much, and we think of others too little. We don't consider others before ourselves. We don't think about how our actions are going to affect those around us. Amen? And so we, we, we are like a bull in a china shop sometimes, just barreling through life. But Paul here says, don't do that. Let, don't do the things you do out of that selfishness and that conceit. But in lowliness of mind, humbly let each esteem or consider or value others better than himself. So in order to be the, uh, uh, the, 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 the powerful testimony for Christ that God calls us to be, we need to put others before ourselves. We need to consider their, their uh, what, what's 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 best for them. We need to consider their feelings, how, how, how what we're going to do is going to um, affect them. Verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Uh, this is not saying to look out for you first and then look out for somebody else. <laughs> That's what a lot of people want to say with this. Listen, well, before you take care of somebody else, you got to take care of yourself and so forth. And well, listen, I understand that what they're trying to say there, but uh, what Paul is saying here is that we already know how to take care of ourselves. We already know how to look out for our own interests. Whether we are trying to or not, that comes naturally. It's, it's what even evolutionists call self-preservation, right? That's, that, we naturally know how to do that, friends. So we don't have to learn how to be self, self-preservation. What we need to learn how to do is to put others before ourselves. To put us second, to put ourselves last, and, and to put others before us. So Paul here in the next section goes on to give us the best example of this ever. Verse 5 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Friends, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to change our mind. Amen? From a selfish self-centered, self-focused to an others focused. So how do we do that? Here Paul says, listen, get this mindset. Change your attitude. Change your heart. Get this mindset. Get the mind, the heart, the attitude of Christ. And he goes on to explain exactly what he means. He, look at this example. Now, so let me just share with you here. Verse 5 through 11 is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. It is, a, it is one of the greatest Christological passages in talking about Christ of all of Scripture. But it was also uh, believe, believed to be a hymn in the New Testament, or in the early church. Um, so whether it was a hymn first, and Paul used that hymn as an illustration, or, or they took what Paul wrote and made that into a hymn, um, the early church is believed to have sung this as a song, as a hymn to Christ. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who... Being in the form of God or being, um, being in very essence, very nature God. Friends, just as John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, 
was eternally with the Father in heaven. He was not just a God. He was not one of many gods. He is the God. Who, being in the form of God, or being in very nature God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. We know that Jesus, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We know he is, in essence, equal with the Father. Yet, the scripture here says that he did not consider it robbery. Probably better translation, he did not consider it something to be grasped hold of to be equal with God. Um, let me explain kind of what that means. Uh, let's imagine that you were driving down the road and, and maybe you were speeding or maybe doing something worse. Maybe you were driving drunk, okay? You should not be driving drunk, okay? This is just pretending. But let's say that you were and you got pulled over by a policeman. And right then and there, the policeman then not only gave you a ticket and arrested you, but he said, I'm going to have to, what, take your license away from you. <gasps> No, no, you can't do that. I'm not going to give you my license. I'm going to do that. What, what, what's our natural reaction there, right? Our natural reaction is, I've got to have my license. I, you can't take that from me, right? And so that is, that's the word that's being used here. It says that, that, that Jesus did not consider it something to be grasped hold of, that he couldn't let go to be equal with God. But, verse 7, he made himself of no reputation. Uh, literally, the word Greek word there means he emptied himself. It doesn't mean that he wasn't God anymore. Jesus was always fully God and he became fully man. But he emptied himself. He was willing because when he came to earth, listen, he didn't he set aside some of the rights and privileges that he had as God. The glory, the majesty, the wonder, the splendor of heaven. We could go on and on, but he set some of those things aside uh, in order to come and, and do what he did for us. He made himself, he emptied himself uh, and made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Again, same word there, taking the very essence, the very nature of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. So here's the picture. That the God of the universe, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, was willing to, the King was willing to step down off of his throne and come and mingle among the commoners. It's what Jesus did. It's what he was willing to do. Verse 8, it says, and being found in appearance as a man. Doesn't mean that he just appeared to be a man. It means that he was so much more. They saw him as a man, but there was so much more than him just being a man. He humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So the God of the universe was willing to step out of heaven, to put on humanity and to become a human being, to become one of us commoners in order to then do something else that took him even lower, if you will, he was willing to humble himself, and even when they should have, he didn't demand, he didn't come and say, you need to worship me now. No, what did he do? He deserved our worship, but, but he was mocked and scorned and beaten and, and nailed to a cross and crucified. And he was willing to do that for us. What ultimate example of humility that is shown there. Now, here's what I want you to notice. And Paul, in those three, four short verses, um, gives a beautiful display of Christ's hum humbling of himself. Look at what it says now in verse 9. Therefore, God has also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now, um, you say, well, he was already God. Yes, he was already God, but let me, in the Old Testament, we, we can look back and we see Christophanes and when, when, when God appeared to man and so forth, but we didn't know the name. We didn't know that the second person of the Trinity, Jesus' name then, did we? Here, after he's done this for us, God the Father has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, listen, Jesus humbled himself and, and I say, well, who's going to take care of me? 
God is. Amen? Just as God the Father took care of the Son, and He has now highly exalted Him because He was willing to do the dirty work and come and to die for us. Now, understanding that, let's go back to verse 3 and 4. Let's read that again. Keeping in mind what we just read that Christ did for us. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Was there any selfishness or conceit in what Christ did for us? None. But in lowliness of mind, in a willingness to set aside our rights as Christ did, in a willingness to take on other people's hurts as Christ did, in a willingness to to meet people where they are as Christ did, let each consider others better than himself. That's the very definition of what he did. Amen? Let us Consider others, value others better than ourselves, like Christ did. Let us look out not only for our own interests, but also for the interests of others, like Jesus did. What a, what a great example for us. Amen? It's the example that provides our salvation, but the example that gives us the motivation to live and to, to, to put it out there for, uh, for us. Amen? I. I don't know, um, you know, I read through the news and we're fist bumping this morning as we joke about the coronavirus and we don't know about that. But there's a lot of things in the news. Um, Unfortunately, one of those this past week was the tornadoes in in Tennessee. And uh, there was a lot of bad stuff that went on there. I happened to read a story about a young couple who um, were right in the path of where one of the tornadoes hit and um, they, when they heard about the storm, they went down in their basement to, um, to, for safety. And, and uh, a few minutes later, they heard just what you thought, the ra- loud noise, the train noise, and all that. And they said in the matter of about 60 seconds, it was gone. They came up out of their basement and began to look around. They saw part of their house torn off. They saw some of the rooms collapsed in and so forth. But instead of going and starting to dig through their own stuff and try to figure out what was wrong they went outside because their concern was this happened to us what happened to our neighbors and they went outside and they saw several houses around them that had literally uh, been torn to pieces and imploded on top of themselves they out of concern for their neighbors began to walk their neighborhood and near going near the rubble asking is there anybody in there anybody need help and one of the houses they got to they heard voices. Yes, we need help. An elderly couple had gone down in their basement. Um, Praise the Lord, had not gotten hurt, but had been trapped as their whole house collapsed and down. They said it was about four feet above them and they couldn't get out at all. Other people began to show up on the scene and this couple whose own house was torn apart began to dig through that rubble to get that couple out. They, they got them out, they, they're, 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 good. they're fine, they're safe and everything. But friends, that is the type of humility and looking out for others instead of ourselves that Christ is talking about. That we are to consider others before ourselves. That we are, shouldn't run to take the first place in line, but we should say, no, you know what, you go ahead. We, we, we shouldn't take the, the, the front parking spot. Now listen, please don't misunderstand me here. I know there's some of you that, that can't walk that far and you need that. But if, if you are physically able, we, you should not be the one that's in the first parking spot next to the door. Consider others better than ourselves. Those are just some very random man, there's so many different ways that we should live this out. And that kind of leads us into the last way in which we can live with, a, with an attitude of humility. We need to stop looking out for number one. We need to start considering others better than ourselves, like Jesus did. And the third way that we can do that, friends, is to live out our salvation obediently. To live out our salvation obediently. I, I want you to look at verse 12 with me, if you will. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, 
Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So here, Paul says, listen, because of all that, because of what I've just said, as you have been obedient in your lives, whether I'm there or whether I'm not, look at what he says. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. Now, as Baptists, as believers, we don't like to associate the word work with salvation, do we? We don't like to put those two words together because uh, we know, rightfully so, that salvation is not by our works. Paul is clear about that. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? Amen. So we know that our salvation is not by works, but yet Paul here, just in another letter, tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So what does that mean? Uh, If works aren't aren't the means to salvation, then what does he mean by work out your salvation? Friends, what I believe he's saying here is not that works is the means of salvation, friends, but works are the result of salvation. Um, Think of it this way. Let's imagine a friend of yours or somebody sent you a, 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 a flower or a potted plant uh, for Christmas. It was a gift. Now, I don't know about you, um, but we've gotten gifts like that for Christmas, and I don't have a green thumb. And sometimes if you set that plant on the table and you don't water it or take care of it or do anything with it, what's going to happen to it? It's probably going to die. It's at least not going to be healthy, Right. So the plant is a free gift, but you've got to water it. You've got to nurture it. You've got to tend it. You've got to take care of it. Friends, it's not a perfect analogy. Believe that. Listen, our salvation is a free gift available because Christ died on the cross for our sins. God gives us salvation because of what Jesus did, not because of what we do. But because of that and because we're saved, our lives should be changed, should be different. Amen? Amen. And if they're not, then maybe we don't truly understand what Christ did for us and the desperate nature of our situation. But because we understand that, then our lives should be different. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, right? So God saves us, but He saves us and redeems us, not to live for us, but to live for Him. Amen? That's what he's talking about here. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, with a healthy fear of God. Amen? Don't forget about God after you're saved. Verse 13 verifies that. It says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Friends, so so the deal is our, our, our works, our good works are to flow out of our salvation, out of a relationship with Christ. We need to come to Christ. We need to be saved. But understanding what he did for us, which Paul so richly explained to us in verses 5 through 11, that ought to change and affect the way we live afterwards. Amen? As we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as we live out our salvation obediently. We focus on our completed salvation. That's where our mind is. We're grateful for that. And let that color everything we do in our lives. And friends, because our very nature was founded in the humility of Christ, as Paul so wonderfully lays out for us here, then that ought to cause us to live with an attitude of humility now. Amen? Let's look at a couple more verses. Look at verse 14. Here in verse 14, it seems like Paul makes a sharp right turn. It seems like, where does this come from, Paul? All of a sudden, after all that, Paul says, do all things without complaining and disputing, or complaining and arguing. I won't ask how many of us like to complain and argue, right? Um, So what does that have to do with what he's talking about there? Well, I believe in verse 12 and 13, what he's saying there is, as you've always obeyed, continue obeying. Work out your salvation with, obey what God has told you to do. But let me ask you a question. How many of you obey always the first time without any argument when God tells you what to do? Raise your hand high if that is you. You obey always 100% immediately. If you're raising your hand, I need to talk to you after, after church. Because you've got a lying problem or a self-awareness problem, okay? Um, You do not always obey 100% what God is wanting you to do. 
and neither do I. Um, that should be our goal, and we should try. But what Paul is saying here is, what do we do? We end up like the Israelites in the Old Testament. We complain and argue. Oh, but God, listen, you don't understand my point of view, God. Or, you know what, yeah, I'd like to be humble, but you know what, then who's going to look out for me? You know, and we argue with God, and we go back and forth about that. And that's why he says, do all things without complaining and disputing. He says, listen, live your life obediently without all of that. Look at verse 15, and here's the reason. That you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Why? Why should we do that? Why do we need to obey? Why do we need to let the world see it? Because so that we can be a powerful testimony for the gospel of Christ. Paul goes on in the rest of chapter 2. To talk about, it seems very random. Paul then goes, listen, he says down in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. He goes on down in verse 25, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Why does he talk about Timothy and Epaphroditus, two of his fellow workers? Here's why. I want you to look at verse 20. About, speaking about Timothy, look at what Paul says. He says, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know His proven character, that as a son or like a son with His Father, He served served with me in the gospel. Why is He talking about Timothy? Because He's saying Timothy is a great example of what I just told you about. Timothy has humbly served you he goes on to talk about Epaphroditus down, down later in verse 25 through 30. And look at verse 29. Talking about Epaphroditus, he says this. He says, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service for me. So what he's saying is, listen, look at Timothy. Epaphroditus almost died for the gospel. He wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about you. And that's another example of how we as believers who have been saved by the grace of God should lay our lives out for him. Not in order to be saved, but because we're grateful for what he's done in our lives. I want to share one more story with you and then we'll be done. Paul A.I., yes, just the letters A.I., um, was a Vietnamese witch doctor who got saved shortly after the Vietnam War and then served as a pastor and an evangelist in Vietnam for many years before being kicked out. Paul A.I. spent about ten and a half years in various Vietnamese communist prisons through the years for sharing his faith and preaching the gospel. The prisons in Vietnam were primitive to say the least. There was no climate control, so oftentimes at night it got very cold. So what did they do? They simply gave the prisoners a four-foot by four-foot blanket to try to keep warm. That's all they had. While in prison, Paul A.I. wanted to share the gospel with his friends with his newfound friends there in prison. And so he came up with a plan. He came up with an idea. Here was his plan. Paul A.I. decided that he would offer his blanket to other prisoners for the night so they would have their blanket and his blanket under the condition that he could talk to them before going to sleep. Guess what he wanted to talk to them about? That's exactly right. Those who took him up on his offer got to hear the gospel. Friends, simply by this man being willing to not consider his own comfort, to consider others better than himself, to not look out for number one, but to consider others better than himself, over 600 people in that prison received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Simply because he was willing to part with a four foot by four foot blanket. Can I just say that true humility doesn't come naturally? It's a supernatural thing. When we allow the Holy Spirit of God to penetrate our hearts, 
The first step to true humility is admitting that we ain't got it. Friends, here's the deal. When Jesus told the disciples, listen, he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Right after that, he said, unless you become like a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. We talked about this not too awful long ago. But what he means there is simply this, friends, that we have to be willing to, to humble ourselves and to admit our need for God, to admit our need for Christ, to admit that our selfish, self-centered ways are not getting us where we thought they would get us. And we're willing to turn from that and allow Him to come into our life. And it's simply calling out to Christ, believing that He died for us and rose again and saying, Lord Jesus, I need you for salvation, for, for, to go to heaven when I die, but I need you now to fill me and to make me a new person. Friends, where does true humility comes? It comes when we allow Christ to come into our life and we allow Him to change our hearts. Lord, come in. Save me and change my heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. If you're here this morning, and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, I want to invite you to come to Him today. Maybe you're here today and you've been saved. You've trusted Christ as your Savior. You're walking with Him. But you've realized in this that you've let pride hang on way too much. I believe part of the Christian walk and part of that walk of sanctification is every day dying to self and living for Christ. Maybe today... You need to say, Lord, I need to die to myself. I need to set aside my arrogance, my pride, my know-it-all-ism. And admit, Lord, that I need you in everything. Not just for salvation, but Lord, I lean on you and rely on you. And I want to let my life be a powerful testimony just of the same things that Jesus did for me. How's God moving in your heart? And will you respond to Him before you leave here today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray and ask, Lord, that you'll just move in our hearts today. Lord, take away any obstacles. Bind the evil one. Holy Spirit, do your work in us. Give those who are here today that need to respond to you, Lord, need to need to turn from some things. Maybe just need to, it's just simply a prideful attitude. Whether it's in salvation or whether it's for sanctification, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, help us continually turn to you and let that start today with humbling ourselves. Maybe even on our knees here at the altar, Lord. Recognizing our need for you. In Jesus' name, amen.